I thought about some of you here thinking about cars are teaching your children to drive for the first time. What an exciting experience. In fact, I kind of thought there may not be something that helps prepare adults to meet the Lord more quicker than to help your <laughs> child learn how to drive. You are <laughs> navigating down the bush at 70 miles an hour. You've got to be ready to meet the Lord at any time if you're teaching your child to drive here in Texas, here in Dallas. Well, I thought about that. There's, there's so many things in the car we do, and we just don't even think about it. You know, you get in and you buckle yourself in and you crank that, push it on, whatever you do to get it on today. And you get your mirrors and then you go and you do that without thought because it's just kind of routine. We're used to that. When we teach our kids, we kind of focus them here. You got to look at the gauges. You got to look at these gauges and you got to know them real well. And if you know cars, in fact, you don't have to know anything about cars. You know those gauges up on the screen. I mean, you may not know the particulars of how they're all defined and what they all mean, but you know what they do. That one tells you how fast you're going and one tells you about the temperature. One tells you how much gas you got. You know you're going to be looking right there. Well, here comes the problem. The problem today in 2021 we teach our kids, you look there, look at the gauges, okay? Don't let them go all over. Your car's going to get in trouble if you don't look at the gauges. Well, then you hear a ping, and one of these pops up, and you're wondering, now, I mean, some of them kind of make sense, but then some of them kind of look like Egyptian hieroglyphics. I'm not really sure exactly what that's supposed to mean. You ever have that? The fancier the cars, the more complex the symbols. And you're wondering, I don't know what my car is trying to tell me, <laughs> but it's obvious that something's going wrong. And so what do we do? Well, we could just keep driving until your car breaks down. And that may not be very long with the newer cars we have. Or we could get out the manual. You know that old dusty thing. You can pull it out of your, out of your glove compartment and you open it up and you figure out, okay, this is exactly what that represents. That's what this means. That little symbol, that little doodad is trying to communicate this to me. Well, we're wrapping up something today. We've been talking for the past month about things that seem similar, and yet they're different. They may look like the exact same thing, specific to what we're talking about. There may be some teachings that sound exactly the same, but they're very different. And so today I want to look at a phrase. You see it up on the board. The distinguishing between spiritual and religious, and I want to just kind of walk it through with you about what that phrase means. Because I think like those indicator lights on a car, sometimes we hear certain things. We hear that phrase, I'm spiritual, I'm not religious. And you know, there's got to be more behind that. I, I see the symbol, I hear what you're saying, but I'm not really sure what that means. In fact, I think there's a lot of people who might use that phrase and not necessarily sure what that means. So we're going to navigate it together, look at a couple of things in the Word of God and and that's going to be our time together today in our study. Have you heard it? I'm spiritual, just not religious. It's not new. In fact, it's been around for a long time. I think back in the, in the 60s, it's I want the man, not the plan. Well, the, the phrase today became immensely popular about 10 years ago when there was a YouTube video by Jefferson Bethke that says why I hate religion but love Jesus. That video gained instant popularity, has been seen by over 30 million people, and it became the tagline as a religious identification for those in America, for Christianity in America. In fact, I saw a poll today. This is one poll from one site, but this is what it says. It says that Christianity as a whole is down 22%. Church attendance is down 48%. But those who claim no religion, I'm spiritual but not religious has risen over 269%. It's some people who say, I want Jesus and I want God and I want spirituality, but I don't want the rules and I don't want the baggage and I don't want the obedience. And so give me God and give me Jesus. You keep the rest of it. You keep the rest of those things, all the laws, all the commandments, all the stuff you're asking me to do. I'm not really interested in any of that. The first line of Jefferson's poem begins like this. What if I told you that Jesus came to abolish religion? Now think about that for a minute. What if I came to tell you that Jesus came to abolish religion? Well, you might say Jesus was against some religion. In fact, here in Matthew 6, Jesus was, was very much against hypocritical religion. 
It says in verse 1 of Matthew chapter 6, Beware, practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. Jesus makes it clear there are some things you can do in the service of God that is seen by others, and then there are some things you can do in the service of God to be seen by others, and that's the problem. Because he was against, in verse 2, he was against giving, braggadocious giving. When you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. And verse 5, he's against empty, showy prayers that really are void of any kind of meaning and sincerity. He says, when you pray, you're not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. You go down to verse 16. He was against phony fasting when he says, When you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so that they will be, here it is, noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. And so certainly Jesus was against fasting to be seen, praying to be heard, giving to to be praised. He's against religion that, to be honest, is more about me and nothing to do about God. Certainly he was against that. We might say that Jesus was against empty religion. Right? You think about that phrase in Matthew 15 and verse 8, the people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. So certainly there was some religion Jesus was against. But to say as a blank statement, Jesus came to abolish religion, well, that's just simply not true. Because if you think about it, Jesus was a very religious man. Jesus was born, as, as Paul would say, a Jew. He was born under the law, and during his time on earth, Jesus followed, submitted himself to that law of Moses. And so Jesus built the habit, the custom of going to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He kept the Sabbath, he went to the synagogue. Jesus kept the Passover while he was on earth. In fact, when the apostles gathered all the, the preparations for the Passover, they did so in Matthew 26 by Jesus' direction, by his order. That idea of, of Jesus coming to undo all religion or abolish all religion, that becomes problematic when you look at verses like John 4 and verse 24, that God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Well, we get the spirit. It's no good to be here without any kind of meaning or sincerity or heart. But what about the truth? Truth seems to say there's something you have to do. There's a teaching you have to follow. There's some rules that you need to keep. Or really, it becomes really problematic when you look at a verse like this one. Pure and undefiled, wait a minute, there's a word from God. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Which really just means this. You know it, but maybe sometimes we just need a refresher in this. That just because someone says something and it sounds appealing, it sounds catchy, It's coined in a well-put-together poem. It's made by a crafty YouTube video. Doesn't make it true. Doesn't make what's said in there true. You see, I think what's really behind a lot of this, a lot of this push to be spiritual but not religious, is this. I want God, and I want Jesus, and I want them near, but I want to keep all the laws and all the commandments at a distance. Let's just talk about knowing Jesus. Let's just preach about loving Jesus and keep all the rest of that away. And so I'll take God, you keep the Ten Commandments. I'll take Jesus, you keep the church. I love the Jesus that says, love me with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. I don't really care for the Jesus who says, follow me. I'm not really interested in that. Now, if you can get past all the smoke, there's a lot of smoke there. If you can clear all the smoke, do you know what's at the heart of all this? Just spiritual but not religious. There's one question, one question. And it is a question that every single person in this audience will have to answer at one point in your life. Even your children right here, they're going to have to answer this question. You're going to have to answer this question. The question is this. Who do you say that I am? Jesus asked his apostles, who do you say that I am? This is the heart, the crux of this, I'm spiritual, but I'm not really religious. I don't want religion. Because here's the thing. If you break down how it is I see Jesus relationally, 
It determines everything I do with that Jesus for that Jesus going forward. In instance, if, if I say Jesus is my friend, then I think about how close I am with Jesus and intimate I am with Jesus. We have a good relationship together. If I talk about Jesus as my Savior, it points to my dependence on Jesus, how much I need him and maybe my thankfulness or gratefulness for him. Here's one for you. We sang it a lot this morning. Maybe you didn't catch it. Tom did a great job of weaving it into our songs. What about when we call Jesus Lord? Thank you for the cross, Lord. What about Lord? Did you know that word Lord appears over 100 times in your New Testament? Lord Jesus. If you're writing it down, that word Lord in Greek means this. It means master or ruler. Think about that. Downton Abbey, the Lord of the estate. Star Wars, Lord Vader, ruler of the galaxy, right? Lord Jesus, master or ruler. To call Jesus Lord is to acknowledge that he is king, that he is over all, including all of me. Now, here's the thing. Romans 1 and verse 4, we just talked about not what was, but what is. Jesus was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness. Notice, Jesus Christ, not a Lord, not the Lord. Jesus Christ, our Lord. He is proven to be Lord through the resurrection. It proved it. Now, Ricky mentioned in the sermon today about the five steps of salvation. That which the Lord requires through his word about how we can receive that amazing grace. And one of the things he walked through from Romans chapter 10 is the confession. Confession that leads us unto salvation. He talked about that great analogy of saying, I do, before you get married. He didn't notice, he asked if anyone was going to take his name. My Noah raised his hand. So you've got about 18 years and a couple bills to pay with my Noah. But he's, he's yours, buddy. <laughs> Noah Jenkins. <laughs> Let me ask you a question this morning. When we made that confession, right? when you made that confession, what did you confess? What, what did we confess? Maybe say it this way, what should we have confessed? Sometimes people say, well, we confessed our sins. No, no, that's not what it is. We might say, I confessed my belief in Jesus. That's part of it. That's part of it. But did you notice what Paul said? Specifically in that context, if you confess with your mouth what? Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Not Jesus is a Lord or the Lord of Lords. What he is saying is when you make the confession, what you are confessing is he is now my Lord. I'm confessing. I know you are the Son of God, and I am submitting and surrendering my life to you. You are my Lord and my King and my Master, and in coming forward and being baptized, I am surrendering myself to you. Peter said in 1 Peter 3 and verse 15, to sanctify, to set aside Christ as Lord in your heart. It's the idea that you are throning Jesus, putting him on the throne of your heart. He is over all of who you are. Colossians 3 and verse 17, that whatever it is you do in word or deed, you do all in the name of this Lord, this master, this ruler, Jesus. And there's going to come a time, brethren, whether if we do it today as we ought to, if we recognize who he is or when he comes all the angels, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess Jesus is Lord. He's Lord. Now here's the problem. Because sometimes a person can say something with their lips and they might say, Jesus is my Lord, but their life tells a completely different story. I might claim Jesus is Lord. I might say, sure, Jesus is my Lord. But then the way I go out and live from here says, no, he really doesn't mean a thing to you because Jesus himself says, why do you call me Lord, Lord? Notice, and not do what I say. Or from Matthew 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, which is Jesus' way of saying this, just calling Jesus Lord does not make him Lord. 
I acknowledge Jesus as my Lord when I honor and obey what he says. Well, Jesus is my friend. I see him more as a friend. Well, if Jesus is your friend, you're going to do what he commands you. Well, all right, but I see him more as a savior. He is my savior, the one who died for me. Well, he came as a savior and commanded all those who would see him as a savior to obey him, to obey him, that source of salvation. You can't get away from it. This is who this Savior is. In other words, if I see Jesus for who he is, not who I want him to be, but for who he is, the only response is that I surrender and obey him. Yeah, how do you know? Seems like you're pushing that kind of hard. How do you know that? Well, let me ask you something. When Jesus showed up on earth and he spoke to the winds and the waves, it says in Matthew 8 and verse 27, the men there in the boat, they said, what kind of man is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? And then there's a scene when Jesus came across this man full of demons and the people around them were so amazed, they debated among themselves saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. And Jesus says there's coming a day and a time that he will speak and the dead will hear his voice. Hear the voice of the Son of God, and they will live. Now, let me ask you something. What do the winds and the waves, what do demons, what do dead souls show us about Jesus? All creation shows us that we are to submit to the voice of Jesus, that when he speaks, we listen. When he commands, we obey. All creation understands it. He is Lord of lords, King of kings. He is over all, and that means over all of me, me. In fact, Ricky took us through this today. Our lessons were so parallel today. We didn't do this on purpose. It just kind of happens sometimes. But we, when we obey the gospel, I'm looking at a lot of people here. You made that decision. Some of you a long time ago. When we made that choice to obey the gospel and to give our lives to Jesus, those disciples in the book of Acts, chapter 11, and verse 26, were first called Christians. That is what they were called, Christians. That word Christian means of Christ, belonging to to Christ. You don't belong to yourself anymore. You belong to Jesus. If someone wants to take my car and drive it around Dallas, they could do so if I gave them permission. But if they took the car from the parking lot and drove around Dallas, they're going to have the Dallas squat, uh, squat car. They're going to have the police force. I couldn't get the title. They're going to have the police after them because they didn't have my permission because they don't own it. That's mine. That's mine. I might invite you to my house later on. and We have a meal. But if you start smoking and mutt inside my house, I'm going to ask you to leave. I say, you can't do that. Well, I can't because it's my house. I own it. It's my rules. It's mine. You are of Christ. You belong to Christ. Paul would say it this way. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. What's that mean? You belong to Jesus. You are his. First Peter, we just saying this about being redeemed, knowing that you were not redeemed, purchased, bought back out of your slavery. You were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. God gave the most precious thing that exists in the world for you so that he would say in chapter 2, you don't belong to yourself anymore. You are God's possession. Now, let's click this together. Let's just connect it. If I am a Christian, if I am of Christ and he paid for me with his blood, that means that Jesus, King Jesus, Lord Jesus has a right to determine. Well, he has a right to determine what it is I do with my life. And that means my language, what words I use, and I text, and I type, and I, and I share with others. That means what I do with Facebook, on Facebook, the things I like and share and click and post. That means what it is I do with my time and my habits. It means what I do with my money, how I earn that money, what I spend that on. It means my relationships and my, and my habits. It means all of me. If I've done what Peter said in 1 Peter 3 and verse 15, set Christ, sanctify Christ as Lord of your heart. Lord of all means Lord of all of me, all of me. 
everything, everything surrenders to the voice of King Jesus. All right, so what? What's the big so what? First, to love Jesus, to be a friend of Jesus, is to honor and obey Jesus. You can't separate the two. You cannot separate the word of God from his words, from what he has said. You cannot love Jesus without surrendering to him and doing what he expects. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? And that's the problem. Paul would say in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18, and the goal of God is that Christ would have first place in all things. Jesus will not settle for second place in our lives. Second to ourselves or second to any other idol or any other person. Loving Jesus, friendship with Jesus means that I listen and honor him. I don't think we get there. I think we understand that. There's something, though, I, I want to share with, with especially the, the younger audience here. And by younger, I mean about 40 and younger-ish, maybe even 50. I'm not really sure where to lump it in. It's at least 40s is where this really starts to come. Many of you had relatives who fought in the Second World War. My grandfather fought in the Second World War. In many ways, that seems like a lifetime ago, doesn't it? So far removed from where we are today. It's hard to imagine what those, at that time, 15 and 16-year-olds were forced to do. The decisions they had to make on the spot. How they were thrust from, from men like my grandfather, from the cornfields in the middle of the United States into a foreign country with a weapon in their hands and forced to make some incredibly hard decisions. It'd be unfair for me to be critical and judgmental of any of the choices they made. Because I wasn't in their shoes. I didn't have to make those choices. In fact, because of their bravery, they fought a war that I will never have to face. I will never have to fight. And so instead of being critical or judgmental, which is not at all in my heart, what ought to exist is a great deal of gratitude and thankfulness because they did the best they could. They were not perfect, but you know, they did the best they could to try and keep the next generations alive, to fight for freedom and the things that mattered the most. Do you know where I'm going with this? You know, a, a common temptation every younger generation faces is to look at the previous generation with such criticism and judgment. If you're in your 40s, maybe early 50s and younger, it's really easy to look back over those old generations before us spiritually, our fathers and grandfathers in the faith, and to look at some of the battles they fought for the truth. And it's really easy to look back at them and to think they made a lot of mistakes. And if I were in their shoes, I would do things so different from them. And that's not fair. It's not fair because we weren't in their shoes. We weren't there. I mean, can you imagine in one moment you're trying to understand what the truth teaches and these are things that, that sound new, discussions, arguments that are new all of a sudden and people that you counted on as, as more than just brethren, family, are now seeming like enemies and churches are splitting and preachers are getting fired. Can you imagine how, how hard that would be? Now, did our fathers and grandfathers of the faith handle everything perfectly? No. Just like you and I don't handle everything perfectly today. Were they just trying to pick a fight? Were they just contentious? No. No, they were good men and women who tried more than anything to just stand for the truth and help their, their children and their grandchildren and the churches at that time to remain true to King Jesus. 
And so what happened before and the battles of what happened before, what took place from the generations before does not deserve or merit our judgment or our criticism. Brethren, it deserves our thanks and our respect for men and women who stood for the truth. There's a reason I'm coming to this because here's the temptation, the temptation of every young generation. When we look at what happened before, as we said, all they wanted to do was fight. All they did was argue. And you know what? It was just over a bunch of doctrinal things that really don't matter. It doesn't matter what a church does and its work and its money and all those things that they were fussing about. None of it really matters. Says who? Who says those things don't matter? Who says those subjects are unimportant? Who says they're not worth teaching on and standing up for? Who says? You and me? Because I'll tell you what Jude says. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to all the saints, to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Hear that again, because all those who want to say all that fussing, all that arguing over doctrine. Let's just focus on what matters the most. Just love Jesus. Let's just believe in Jesus. Well, guess what? Jude says, I'm getting up here, to contend to, for the faith. Because there were people of that generation who denied their only Lord and Master Jesus, which means this, work it backwards. If Jesus is my Lord, I will stand, I will fight, I will contend for the faith. Why? Because everything King Jesus says matters. Let's be done with those labels. Is this a salvation issue? Is this a fellowship issue? If Jesus has spoken on it, it matters. It matters, and we're going to be true to the book. I know that's oversimplifying. I understand that, but can we at least just see it from a standpoint? If God has said something about it, let's stand for that. Let's teach on that. Let's try and be true to that. Yes, it matters. Yes, it matters, because he said it, because the word revealed it. I would much rather be seen as someone who wanted to stand for the truth and maybe did so a little aggressively, maybe passive, maybe, maybe passionately, than to be a person of peace who held hands with my brethren and walked down the road of error. I would much rather be harsh about the truth to help people stay with Jesus than to love you away from God. Sometimes there's a battle worth fighting, brethren. Sometimes there's a time to stand and to speak. Let's not be naive into thinking that the battles our grandparents had to fight are not battles that you and I will have to fight one time too, one day too. Were you ever the victim of this at school? Did you ever do that at school? You know, you got that sticky note and you got that one student just under your skin, that one preacher who's shouting at you from the pulpit. So I'm just going to put those sticky notes on the back. Labels. I was doing my work yesterday. I was going over things, just doing my preachy stuff. And my Noah, who's here with me today, came up to me. And he handed me this little note that says, I have a sermon. I love you, Appa. (laughs) It's the best sermon that's been written. (laughs) And this stays with me. Which means there's a lot of people and they may say a lot of things. But it doesn't matter. Because I got someone who knows me and loves me. And this means more than anything anyone else could say. There's a lot of labels that come from standing on the truth. They're old fashioned, they're too traditional, they're too strict. 
that you're stuck in the old ways. You're so contentious. You know, I, when all those sticky notes are piled all together, one after another, of all the things that can be said about those who try to do the right thing and stand on the truth, I just, I look at a passage like Galatians 4 and verse 9 when Paul says, but now that you have come to know God, or rather, to be known by God. If I'm known by God, and my God knows me and he knows my name, and my God is pleased with the life that I am trying to live, I could care quite less about all the things that people would have to say and all the labels and all the things that they could stack up about what it is I'm trying to do. Not, none of it amounts to anything compared to the thoughts and the words of God. I'm not trying to please men. I'm not trying to make sure the brotherhood is pleased with the way that I'm walking or living. I'm trying to make sure that King Jesus is pleased with the way that I'm living and I'm walking. That's what matters the most. The most important question in all this, are you traditional? Are you strict? Are you spiritual? Are you religious? Here's the most important question, and it's one you've got to answer before you leave today. Who is Jesus to you? Who do you say that he is? Is he someone you're interested in? Is that fascinating historical figure? Is he a friend? Or is he your Lord, your Savior, your King? And if he is not, today can be the day you make him so. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Jesus will be your Lord when you submit to the voice of this king. King Jesus says to turn from your sins, to repent, to leave that life completely behind. King Jesus says to believe in him and to be baptized. In Mark 16, verse 16, believe and be baptized and you will be, sa you will be saved. King Jesus expects we do the best of this we can to honor him with our life, with our actions, with our words. Today, King Jesus is calling for you to come. If we can help you, if we can encourage you, if we can pray for you, if we can help you begin your journey submitting to your Lord, whatever it is we can do, let's do it right now. Let's do it as we stand and as we sing.